Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started with our program. My name is Jamie Terrell. I lead growth and communications here at Saltmarsh. I would like to welcome you on behalf of our team to today's webinar on CMMC readiness. If you're a regular guest of our webinars, welcome back. If you're here with us for the first time, know that you can find recordings and materials for any of our previous webinars on our website's Resource Center and YouTube channel. This is the first of a series that we intend to hold regularly as developments continue in the CMMC space. Today's program will address some of your readiness concerns as well as NIST 171 and your cyber score. We're joined by two of our own IT security experts, Stefan Reyes, shareholder and provisional assessor with the CMMC accreditation body, and Jason Keith, who is a senior technology risk consultant for our firm and also a registered practitioner with the CMMC accreditation body. Thanks to you both for leading our presentation today. Before we get started, I have just a few quick housekeeping items. First, everyone on the line has been muted. If you have questions during the presentation, we invite you to share them with me in the Q&A uh, feature that you'll see in your GoToWebinar controls. We'll have time, if, if we have time to address some of your questions, we'll go ahead and do that before we wrap up. Um, you're also welcome to share your questions with us by email. You can send those to info at saltmarshcpa.com and someone from our team will follow up with you. We'll also have our speakers contact information available in the slides. So if you'd like to reach out to either of them directly, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, finally, on upon leaving our webinar today, you'll be prompted to complete a very short survey. Uh, should take just a couple of seconds. So take a moment to share your feedback with us. We always appreciate that. Um, and with that, I will hand things over to Jason Keith to get us started. Jason. Thanks, Jamie. Well, first, thanks everybody for attending. Uh, we really appreciate it. And uh, we're gonna spend a little bit of time today just talking about CMMC, talking about NIST 800-171 and how the two maybe are similar and how in some cases they're different. Uh, and, and as Jamie kind of mentioned, this is part of a series that, that we'll be going through. So we'll take, you know, every month or so, we'll take another topic and we'll kind of build on this as we go. And we invite you to join us as we go through the process. And it's, uh, you'll see as we talk today, this is going to be a learning experience for us. This is a learning experience for everybody. Uh, there's a lot going on in CMMC space, and, and we'll try to unpack that. And interestingly, with the with the interim rule change, there's quite a bit going on with the NIST space as well. So uh, when you leave today, what I hope you'll know is that first, CMMC and NIST are very closely linked together, and there's or NIST 800-171. And there's a lot to be gained by taking time with the 171 process, the evaluation process to help you work your way into doing well on the CMMC process when that comes along. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, we'll spend a bit of time talking about maybe how you evaluate yourself, how you prepare for this. And uh, then one thing that I kind of said at the top and I want to reiterate again is that it's, it's a fluid process that we're in right now. Uh, if you've been following CMMC and a lot of us have been trying to follow what's going on, you'll know that every day there's something different, it seems. And, uh, you know, for example, on Tuesday, there was a great town hall that the accreditation body put on. And there was a lot of discussion from the DOD about how the process will unfold. And then again, overnight, there was a little bit of information on reciprocity. Uh, and then I think we were all a little surprised, or most of us were surprised a little bit, when the cyber score reporting requirement came down in September when the rule change happened. So it's a, it's a process and nobody has totally figured out. The pieces are being put into place and the way the evaluations are done are being put into place. Of course, the framework exists, but there's still a lot of, a lot of distance to go from, for most of us from where the requirement takes hold to where we actually will be evaluated. And then, uh, you know, the, the last thing that I just want you to leave here with as far as a takeaway is that no matter what happens on how CMMC is done or on the way that, you know, if NIST really comes back and does a little bit more, no matter what happens, there seems to be a clear focus on cybersecurity. So no matter what we, what finally comes out, it seems that no longer can we just kind of say, yeah, we're thinking about cybersecurity and sign off on that. There's going to be a validation process. Someone is going to come in someone is gonna check and make sure that uh, you're actually doing all the things that the requirements say that you're gonna do. And at some point it's gonna be very soon, now really, it's gonna be a part of whether or not you can do business with the DOD. And I think increasingly probably we'll see this to expand even further into other entities as well. And uh, we'll expand on that a little bit later on. Um, so, you know, as we think about where we are today, maybe it takes, maybe good to take a minute for those of us that are kind of just 
joining in on this process and really kind of trying to understand what's happening, maybe go back and take a look at this timeline. You know, what has occurred, what is what's occurred within the last year, especially there's an awful lot of things happening then, you know, and then what the rollout may look like on a go forward. So just kind of keeping our mind back that, yes, we've got NIST here. And, and that really came into play there in 2016 with the uh, with the DFARS Clause 7012. You know, it really is designed to handle CUI, which we'll talk a little bit about CUI. And for several years, most of us just had a requirement that we needed to follow the process and make sure that we were complying with it, but we didn't have to report a score. Uh, and then at the beginning of 2020, CMMC had been talked about, much talked about for quite a while. As a matter of fact, about what, three days, in three days, so January 31st, 2020, they released the framework for CMMC. And you know that was the first time I had really gotten a good solid look at the, the physical framework and actually what it said. And they had this ambitious timeline that said, here's what we're gonna accomplish over the next year. They were going to stand up an accreditation body. We'll talk a little bit about that and what's happened with it. They were going to get some provisional assessors in the field. And we thought, well, that's going to be a lot to do with COVID. They were going to get uh, C-3PO's out there trying to, to get, you know, a certification groups going. And they were going to write all the rules and all the processes to actually complete the certifications and go through. And then they were going to announce some contracts that they were going to actually put CMMC in in 2021, which is where we are now so that they can actually go through the testing and see how well this process flows. And surprisingly, even with COVID going on, uh, we found that they, they, stuck to the, they stuck to the path. Now, if you've really followed it closely, you'll know that it's been a bit of a rocky road at times, but, but to give credit to the DOD and the accreditation body itself, they've done a good job kind of keeping on task with what they set out for themselves to do. And then from 2021 through 2026, and really the very end of 2025, so January 1, 2026, everybody's gonna have it. But from 2021 to 2020, the end of 2025, CMMC is going to be in everything. And then uh, let's see, let's move on past the timeline here. So we'll talk a little bit about just briefly what CMMC is in case you don't know. And then we'll transition towards, you know, a little bit on into the, the presentation here into NIST specifically what we do with the cyber score. But you know, CMMC is basically at its heart just a framework of cybersecurity standards that we want to try or practices for the terms that we use that, that an organization should have and able to handle two things, federal contract information. Again, we'll give you a little bit broader detail of that and also CUI. And then there's a, there is a, um, a level, varying level, and we'll talk about those in just a second of what different ones you must comply with to hold different types of information. But at its heart, it's really just an attempt to take the defense industrial base, which is estimated that you hear lots of different numbers, 250,000 to 450,000 different separate companies and entities out there. And so there's gonna be some cybersecurity requirement on everybody, whether or not we're, if we have a contract and we have access to some information in public, whether or not we have one employee, whether or not we have 10,000 employees. And there's gonna be some specific processes that we must follow and some, some certifications that we must get to make sure that we comply and can bid and continue to work with the DOD. So on the next slide, we'll, we'll do a little bit of a discussion on the, the details within it. So, you know, we talked about the rollout. We've got this five-year period here where everybody's gonna eventually get it. Every contract's gonna get it. And as they renew, they're all gonna have this requirement for CMMC. There's five levels, you know, at the very basic level, the one and the two, that's really just things like having passwords and changing passwords and having unique passwords and having some physical security. It's something that most of us can achieve, but the, the trick is a lot of us that will have to have level one may have never had to really look into our cybersecurity program before. So it'll be a bit of a heavy lift there. And then when you get into the three to the five, that's more like where you're at. And well, three is almost equivalent to where we are with the NIST 171. It's a process for handling CUI, which is controlled, unclassified information. And there's going to be a lot more, you know, there's a lot more digging that we have to do, a lot more proof that we have to do in that certification process. But things to know is you'll have to have somebody come in that's independent and do an assessment every three years to validate what level it is that you need. And then, uh, you know, you can bid on a contract just the way we're told, but you cannot actually receive the award for the contract unless you've completed that certification process. And then lastly, something a lot of us are spending time with consultants. And, uh, you know, if you have somebody come in to help you, 
and help you get your process ready. That's that's great. If that's what you need, help help you get your process ready. But that same person cannot come back and do the assessment. So you're really going to be looking at a group of people who are independent assessors, and their job is to come in and say, pass, fail. You did it or you didn't do it. It's going to be a very specific process. And then you've got consultants that may help you get to that process if you've got a lot of work you need to do within your internal network. And then, you know, at the end of it, you're going to have a certification system a one, I'm a two, I'm a three, and it's going to impact what you're going to be bidding on, what kind of contracts that you're going to be working with. Uh, going to the next slide, you'll just kind of see how the breakdown is. Now, there's level four and five is really intended to be a very high level uh, review process. You know, four and five is going to be something that almost nobody is really going to have to deal with out there in, in, in the dip. You know, there's going to be a few very significant companies, very different, you know, very, um, a very sensitive access to information companies. They're going to have four and five, but most of us are going to fall in level one, two, and three. Ninety-nine percent of contracts are going to fall in there, according to you know what we're seeing. And you know, level three again is kind of where we are now with the NIST 171 handling CUI. Level one and level two is you don't have access to that, but level two is you're building your way up there. You know, you're going from basic cybersecurity to being able to hold the CUI. And level one, again, is really just having some, some very specific, you know, very basic things to make sure that you have a secure system because you may have access to some information about a federal contract. And then the key kind of to watch here at the bottom of this graphic is that no matter what happens with CMMC, you're still gonna have this requirement around NIST 800-171. It's not going away. At least at this point, it's not going away. It may at some point migrate its way away, but it's going to continue to underline and underwrite a lot of these contracts, you know, especially through the next five years and very likely forever. Why, you know, if, if you're potentially, if you're the government, why would you release one? Why not just keep two in place? So there's going to be, a, they're going to be very well synced together, but there's going to be a sense where you need to remember you've got two different things to comply with, perhaps. And so moving next on into this uh, into this presentation, I'm going to let Stefan do a little bit of discussion about the accreditation body. We kind of had a, a just a brief overview of it just a minute ago, but you know this is probably a good time to give you a, if you don't know what a provisional assessor is, kind of give you a detail. He, you know, Jamie mentioned at the top of this, he's a provisional assessor, and what a provisional assessor you know at this point is is one of the first few that are kind of they're going through these pilot contracts that are out there and they're going to be doing some assessments uh, until the process is fully built up the assessment you know the assessment piece is not open to anyone that wants to be an assessor it's open to these provisional assessors there are 100 right now i think they may look at adding a few more um the second prize more details on that than i do but you know at this point He's been as in the know as any of us have been as far as being on the working groups and listening to what the CMMC AB has to say and following the news. And I can tell you that he'll probably say the same thing, that it's fluid. And if we tell you something one day, that's probably the case. But it's very possible that especially when you're talking about CMMC, it could be different in a week. <laughs> All right. So I'll pass it over to you, Stephanie. Yeah, what you said is actually absolutely correct about uh, about it being fluid, just like every part of this. Um, the the accreditation body is is an ever changing uh, ever changing organization. Um, essentially, the accreditation body was formed in order to create that bridge between the government and and the civilian contractors, a way to to uh, su supply the need of the of the DoD to secure its supply chain and to pass that requirement on to their contractors and you know apply a uniform uh, function for that to happen and in order to do that in in true government fashion they had to come up with a whole bunch of new acronyms right that's the that's the job of, of the government i think sometimes is to come up with acronyms and so you'll see all kinds of them like he said you know uh, rp and pa and c3po and osc and all these kind of of acronyms that of course um, at this point some people may not be familiar with but I'm, I'm sure that you'll get familiar with them soon but but you know i'll joke it aside that was kind of part of the first process of the cmmcab was to kind of map this process out and give names to things because uh, as with anything you got to have a common language in order to be able to truly discuss and, and exchange ideas and so that was kind of their first charge is to, to create that common language you know what is what does the what do the parts look like and then how do we define them and how do we uh, go about uh, getting those parts in the right place and so they did that, and they did that in, in part of the framework and part of the process they're doing for, um, for the audit function. But some of the things that they defined was the C3PO, that's a common, you know, 
uh, term you'll hear, um, which is a certified organization that has assessors that performs the assessment, right? They perform the actual audit to certify OSCs. OSCs is an organization cer uh, uh, seeking certification. So that's, that's you all out there. That's your contractors out there that are seeking certification. Um, they're in, called the OSCs in this process. Um, in addition, they created the assessor process and the levels of assessors, the type of assessors who can work on assessments. There's just all these, these things that have to happen, all these mechanics to stand up such a, a complex process, a whole new standard, you know, that's going to you know, be a, across such a broad body. And so that was their initial function was to, to define these things and define the process, define the quality assurance, define all the aspects of implementing a new standard. And, uh, you know, I'm, I know that, uh, Jason already said some, some good things about what they've accomplished and, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't intend to be a, you know, CMMC AB cheerleader, but it's hard not to be uh, impressed with what they were able to accomplish in one year. I mean, quite frankly, th there's a lot that's, that's come along. Um, we have the entire infrastructure in place. We do have assessors in place. We have C3POs that are now um, certified as C3POs. However, they're going through their, um, their DIBCAC uh, audit. Essentially, they got to audit the C3POs to make sure that they have the appropriate security in place before they come to your organizations and uh, and you know, audit your organization simply because the information they'll be exposed to you know could be could be sensitive. Um, so there's all that process happening in place, and so much so that you know the AB has been responsible for all that finding assessors, developing training, finding training providers, training content providers. You know all this kind of stuff's been put together. And when I say the CMMC AB is, is, is fluid, uh, what I mean by that is now they're looking at having to reorganize the CMMC AB into kind of two bodies. One that deals with uh, the certifying of professionals and the certifying of C3POs and managing that, that uh, education process. And one that manages the actual certifications as, as they come through and quality assurance and that kind of stuff. And the primary reason is because they truly need to be an accreditation body, meaning they need to be able to provide C3PO, uh, C3POs their accreditation within the ISO standard. So that's something that, um, that we're hearing about new. I know there was some rumor that the CNMC AB was, was breaking up, but that's really not what they're doing. What they're doing is, is kind of bifurcating uh, that process to facilitate um, that part of their mission. Now, uh, that being said, there has been a, a very aggressive rollout plan for how uh, they'll bring these things out to, to individual contractors. And this graphic gives you a little idea of, of the volume of, of uh, assessments that need to be done out there. I mean, the, the, the complexity of the DIB is, is immense when you start to think about who all can be impacted by it. I mean, everything from, you know, a, a contractor that's building an airplane, which wouldn't surprise you, but all the way down to a contractor who may be, you know, providing glass windows for a building that's secure. You know, there, there's a, an immense number of, of contractors that are involved in this process. And, and as you can see, the volume that they're expecting to go through in this year alone, the original accept, expectation was 1,500 certifications. Now, I say that because we're going to, you know, I'm alluding to something we're talking about a little bit later on, and that is most people on this call are probably not going to be getting a CMMC certification in the next year or two. Um, it really is going to be tasked to what we call uh, the, the pilot, uh, the pilot products. Originally, they had the Pathfinder uh, um, organizations, which were the first couple that they tested the process on that we worked to develop the process through. Um, they're moving on now to the pilot uh, organizations which uh, which will be the next phase and then ultimately uh, truly the pilot technically goes all the way till 2025 when it's full but the amount that'll be included they expect to be more and more each year but that's one thing that we we are hearing you know from clients all the time they're calling saying how can i get the certification and how can i get it today and the answer really is you can't I mean, it's just not available at this point um, in fact there hasn't been a c3pao which is the certifying organization, there hasn't been one that's been given the green light to actually do any certifications yet because they're still in the process of doing the background checks and their DIBCAP, uh, DIBCAC uh, audits on the C3POs. So that's still a, uh, a process that's happening and, and it's and continuously uh, changing and being fluid. Um, originally, this was going to be a standalone standard. There would be no reciprocity. Uh, there was always rumors about reciprocity. I, I just saw actually a statement uh, yesterday that came out that, uh, that says that, that it looks like there's gonna be some reciprocity. Um, but even that's complicated because you know, reciprocity with some of the other standards they're discussing don't have the same requirements. Within CMMC, there's no allowance for POEMs. It's either you pass or you fail. Um, with, you know, with the other standards that they're looking to, you know, match with FedRAMP and others, there's an allowance for POEMS. So that doesn't, you know, doesn't align. So there's going to be some work done to understand whether that's going to be a Delta assessment or, or how that uh, reciprocity is going to happen. 
but this stuff is is, is changing by the day. Uh, not to mention we had a change in in, in political leadership, obviously, and that's going to have some impact. However, uh, there's no indication that will slow this down. Both uh, both political parties seem to think that uh, cybersecurity is important uh, for our uh, federal infrastructure, and so uh, there's there's just no uh, slowdown in this process that we're seeing, even with the change in administration. So. I mentioned that this is, you know, to, to secure the information of the of the DoD at this point. Um, again, we say DoD at this point because this was formed by the DoD with some partners, and uh, and some some uh, interested parties that that created this initially to secure DoD, um, and it's to secure what we call CUI or controlled and classified information. Now, uh, that that definition of that information was out actually created uh, two administrations ago, and it's not just for the DoD. It's for all the federal government that has CUI or, or that they've identified. Uh, data as CUI, and they have uh, requirements to protect it. So that is part of the reason why you know we think, and everything seems to be moving in the direction that CMMC will not stay with the DoD. Uh, we had a presentation, as as Jason mentioned earlier this week, um, from the DoD and the AB together doing a town hall to to talk about you know how they're coming together with this rollout. And one of the things they mentioned is there's pilot uh, pilot projects or pilot uh, contracts that they're considering that will be in other areas of federal government, including DHS, DOI. And um, and a couple others. So they're they're looking to uh, potentially use this as a standard beyond just DoD. I and mean, if if you know, my prediction would be this would be the next federal standard. So um, and perhaps even adopted by certain states or some uh, some form of it. So I think this is going to go beyond uh, beyond just the DoD in, in a near term. Uh, I don't think it'll be long. I think by the end of this year we'll see it beyond the DoD. Um, so because simply because CUI is not just the DoD. And you know, simply CUI is is a lower uh, protection level of information. It's information that's that's technically unclassified, so it's not in the secret, top secret. You know, the things we see in in movies or we've if we've been in the military or other places, you, you've dealt with classified information. This is uh, this is technically unclassified information, but it's still controlled, so it's still sensitive. It's still information that uh, could lead to uh, if in the wrong hands uh, to 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 provide some kind of threat that we want to protect. And obviously in many of the contracts that are happening with the, with the, with the DOD, there's information that, that could lead to, uh, you know, sensitive information that could be part of that, that people can put together to use uh, to threaten, uh, you know, the military, the organization. I think uh, one of, one of uh, maybe stealing Jason's example, when he talked about, you know, if, if you have a, a provider of poultry that, you know, suddenly the base orders 200,000 pounds of poultry and normally their, their weak load is, is 50,000 pounds of poultry, well, that can tell someone, well, there's probably going to be an enhanced number of troops at that location that, you know, that week because they're planning on feeding those well, that's information that could be used by uh, by someone to threaten that organization. So even sometimes what seems like menial information can be important to protect, and that's why we have these uh, these other forms, including uh, CUI and, and what I'll get to in a minute, which is which is FCI. But uh, but CUI is what it, is the threshold we're going to have for three and above when you talk about the levels with CMMC. CMMC level one and two are for organizations that do not handle CM or CUI, uh, only FCI. But uh, three through five are going to be for organizations that do handle CUI, and so we'll talk a bit about more, uh, a little more about how that comes about, and what you might do with that as with the levels in a, in a minute. But uh, but classified information, excuse me, controlled and classified information. One of the um, one of the uh, requirements on the government is they're supposed to be identifying this information. They're supposed to be tagging this information, and we haven't seen that happen yet. And that is something that the DoD uh, mentioned on the on the call the other day as well. That they have a, a a large process in place right now that is going through you know their procedures to finalize, um, which is going to be a huge effort to go out and start doing that, start identifying what CUI is or what items are CUI, tagging it properly, and and implement it throughout the DIB. So I expect that we will see by the end of this year that there will be a huge improvement in that process where things will be identified as CUI. And I also think we'll all be surprised somewhat of what is CUI. Um, you know, it's amazing to me how many surprises we get, you know, through this, even though we try to stay on top of it, how many surprises we get. I know Jason mentioned the rule, the interim final rule that came out uh, in September that uh, we all expected. We all knew it was coming. We had been through all the, the town halls. We've heard it come. I mean, about the establishment of the CMMC and how that's going to codify it into the FARS and how that process is going to happen. We knew this that this was coming um, in that interim final rule, but nobody expected that they were going to make an alteration to what the requirements were in 800 -171. That was a surprise to us all, quite honestly. Um, and it was very important. And we'll talk about that in here in a few minutes about how important that is. And that's probably the most important part to the people listening right now is, is that change. 
but uh, but there's continual surprises. It was surprise about reciprocity. And it's you know there's going to be ongoing surprises, including what they decide is is COI um, as we go through this process. So FCI. Um, is federal contract uh, contract information, as, as it's stated here, um, that is not intended for public release. Now, this is, if you read this this document, it's you know it's, it's anything they say it is pretty much, right? That's 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 how we always uh, have to deal with. Um, but but federal contract information is again information that that may be sensitive. It's not for public release, but it's yet not reached reached the level of of, of CUI. Um, we expect FCI to be in probably every contract or, or nearly every contract. Um, there's some exception in the CMMC for what they call micro contracts. So if it's below uh, $20,000 and it's a, and it's a uh, domestic contract, then it's, it's accepted from CMMC requirements, or if it's a below 30,000 for international. But um, obviously those are very, very you know, small contracts. Um, there's also some, some exceptions for, uh, for COTS items and some other items, but, but we expect that you're going to see FCI in, in, in every contract and they're going to have the, the, uh, the compliance requirements coming to that as we, as we progress. Um, this is just a little graphic to kind of talk about, um, you know, how FCI and CUI relate to each other. Um, you know, it's that, you know, CUI is kind of a subcomponent of FCI. And, uh, and where public information comes from. But the, the interesting thing about these items, particularly CUI, is remember is that not only could you be receiving CUI as part of a contract, uh, you could also be creating CUI. You know, in your organization, if you're creating standards for something that you're developing for the military and a contract for them, what you create could become CUI or could be CUI as you create it. Um, so CUI may be something that's provided to you. It may be something you're creating. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways it can come and that's something that's very important to understand on the long term is what is CUI, where it is, how you're going to control it, um, how you're going to keep it within your certified systems, which systems need to be certified to handle it, um, which contractors you're allowed to uh, to share it with, you know, because there's a there's a uh, a flow down provision that uh, that's going to be required to make sure that you have that only in the hands of people who have the certification levels appropriate to handle uh, those those types of information. And and I think Stefan, that's. You mentioned flow down, but that's going to be an important one, both really from this NIST perspective, but also from CMMC perspective to understand. And, and what's we, when we saw earlier how many different contracts would be impacted with just in the first year. So what were there 15 pilot contracts? But ultimately, they think there'll be 1,500 assessments from that because you know you don't have to be the prime contractor. And that's where a lot of us are going to end up finding out we have information and access to information we didn't realize we had. And I, and I know if, if you're doing business with some of the, you know, the bigger guys like Raytheon or somebody like that, they, you know, kind of sent out a, an email when the interim rule change passed and said, hey, you need to validate your systems and go ahead and get your score together and, and let us know that you're where you need to be. And so all of that flow down is going to be such an important key to this, just because you don't have a contract with the government. And, and he mentioned also the micro contract piece, just because your piece of the business is only 10,000. If the overall contract is larger, it's not a micro contract, just your piece of that that you're supporting is. And so you, you maybe find yourself pulled into this more than you think. And, and I think a very important thing also to remember, like you said about CUI, even though it's supposed to be marked, you need to be told you're, you have it. I think we will all come to find out that there's a lot more information with CUI out there than we realize. And I guess we remember this was a 2016, you know, as a 2016 executive action, and it's taken some time to kind of get get feet under it. But that's also part of the reason we think there's a chance, of, or we're fairly certain that it'll roll out into other wider government institutions as well, because CUI is not a it's not a DoD specific thing. There are some specific pieces of information if you go look at the registry that are. DOD focused, but there's also all sorts of other types of information that, that other agencies would have as well. Yeah, and that flow down you mentioned is incredibly important, both under 171 as well as under CMMC. It's incumbent upon the contract prime. So whoever signs a contract with the government, it's incumbent upon that organization to ensure their entire supply chain complies. So you're not only responsible for your compliance, but anyone who provides you services within that contract. And so uh, there's going to be a provision that, or a requirement for you to have uh, a way to account for that, to ensure that, that your, uh, your subs and your suppliers have the certification level, that you're documenting, that you're checking that. that you're, it's, it's going to be uh, something that's going to be a bit more complex as that goes through, particularly in CMMC, but really already on 171. If you're handling C, uh, CUI specifically, we'll talk about you know whether there's some question whether you do or you don't if you don't handle C, CUI. But if you handle CUI, there's just no question that you should be 
accounting for that now you should have um, yourself uh, yourself score reported for your for your own organization but you're also uh, needing to make sure that all of your subs or everybody that's in the supply line for that contract also um, has their their compliance score reported as well okay and the only other thing that i thought you know that i thought maybe we'd mention is at least in the beginning we're hearing and we've seen one case and i've spoken with some others who are saying that sometimes the language for cmmc is making its way into a contract or, or a new contract that's out for bid and uh, at least for the short term even though that language is there and i think it's reasonable to question why it would be there uh, the way that they've set it up is there's one specific person within the government that is supposed to approve each contract that will have it in it because they don't want to I think it's possible sometimes a contracting officer could pull that language, throw it in there, and then that leaves us kind of trying to figure out, well, do we have to comply a bit on the contract? Do we not? And there have been a, a couple instances where some of the DFARS language made it and it's been pulled out. And then there's one right now actually that's pending that we're waiting to see what's going to happen. It's not tied to one of those bigger contracts, but the provision is out there. Uh, so yes. uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna say that's something that, that so in, according to the the interim final rule, the uh, the the Secretary of Defense is the only person who's authorized to approve that provision to be included in contracts. That uh, that um, that privilege has been delegated to the Under Secretary for Acquisitions, who has now delegated it to the CIO for the Under Secretary of, Sec of Acquisitions, which is Katie Arrington. Um, so she has she actually spoke at the at the town hall um, earlier this week, and she mentioned that she is aware that that's happened. And that they're working on a, uh, a training evolution for contract officers to make sure that they're up to date with which provisions that should be included and, and to ensure that those provisions are only included in, in, in the pilot programs. Um, if you do see those provisions included in your contracts, that you know it, we recommend you do uh, reach out to your contracting officer and ask about it. You know, make sure they're clarifying um, if this actually is a pilot program and, and does have a CMMC uh, requirement. And if it does have a CMMC requirement, they're also required to identify what CMMC level is required. And the ones that we've seen so far, and there's been a few, um, really they've put the, the, the provision in the contract, but not identified any CMMC level. And I think that's a pretty good um, pretty good marker to let you know that's probably not appropriately put in that contract. And it's something that you should certainly ask, for, ask about at, at least. Right. So in, in kind of moving on to the NIST 800-171, and we'll try, to be, we'll try to be good with your time and keep moving as quick as we can here. But, um, you know, in thinking about what NIST 800-171 is, is it's really just, the, it's a special publication, but the NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and basically their their whole process is to go through and figure out all these different standards that should apply depending on the situation. So this one, 800-171, is specifically for CUI and it's specifically for non-federal, you know, non-federal systems, IT systems. There's actually another special publication that's specific, you know, that is for the federal government on how they should handle CUI within their systems. And so this focuses in on what we as vendors and direct contractors should be doing if we think that we have CUI. Uh, and then I kind of mentioned that the two are very similar, and we'll spend a little more time talking about that on the next slide in a minute. But just to let you know, there's 110 controls here within the 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 NIST framework, and there's 130 within level three of CMMMC, and 110 of those 130 are these. Now, they might be slightly modified, but they are these. There's some good information out there from NIST on what you should do to meet these controls, and there's a lot of good publication out there, so you don't have to wait and worry about what CMMC is going to tell you. There's a lot of good information now that you can look and say, I know I can get 75% of the way, if I can get these controls implemented, I can get comfortable that I've done these things. I know that I've got a good head start on when it comes time to actually go and certify for CMMC. So know that these two are very similar and know that as you're working on NIST and your, and your certification or, or your assessment there, know that you need to take time and understand what is CMMC asking me to do what would assessors be looking for when they come in? And I might even let Stefan talk for a second on that, just kind of the, the general thought right now on what kind of information they'd be looking for to prove this. And how can I go ahead and give myself a good solid head start as I'm complying with these things for where I wanna be in a year or two years when these CMMC standards also come along? Stefan, I don't know if you shared a yeah, second thought on, on how they want to, uh, how you might wanna go about 
using this moment when you're trying to comply with what is the rule of the day to prepare yourself for the future. Yeah, it's, it's important what you mentioned that to, to work on it now. Um, the, the CMMC does incorporate, um, a, the, the majority of it is, is incorporation of 800-171, something that you're supposed to be complying with right now if you're a contractor. So it's supposed to be already in place. And that's kind of the, the mindset that the DOD has is like, hey, look, these guys have already been supposed to be you know, com complying with 171. We're not adding that much more. You know, there's some arguments about that whether you're a new contractor and this kind of thing. But, but the bottom line is that's, that's the case. 800-171 is in place now. You should be complying with it and you should be working that process. And it's important that uh, to note there's some differences in, in that compliance. Um, as Jason mentioned, taking this time now to prepare as CNMC comes on does make sense. It's not coming tomorrow. You know, that's, there's not a rush that you know, has to be done by next week. However, remember that CNMC is a maturity model. It's in the name of a maturity model, but it also uh, is, is supposed to be meaningful, meaning that part of the things we're supposed to do as assessors is assess, is this, is this security practice part of the culture of the organization? not as it's something that they created yesterday and put in place. So it's going to be difficult to establish that it is a mature part of the organization's culture if it literally was produced last month because you brought a, uh, a readiness person in to help and you know, create policies, create procedures, print them on fresh paper, and get them ready for the audit. Then the question the auditor is going to have is, is this part of the organization's culture? Is this a mature process that they have in place? And, and the answer would be no, you know, if, if it was new. So it is important to start getting these processes in place now so that there is a, an established trail that we can quickly identify and say, look, this has been part of the organization's process. This is mature. This isn't something new that they're going to stop tomorrow. It is actually part of how they operate. So the, the sooner you start that process, the better. Not to mention right now, working under POAMs is, is absolutely acceptable. You know, having those those planning milestones and, and, and um, exceptions to your readiness is absolutely acceptable, but it's not going to be acceptable under CNMC. It's a pass-fail process. Either you have them or you don't. You have all of them or you don't. There's a small provision for what we call a delta assessment. Um, if there are minor revisions that need to be addressed and the assessor and both the assessor and the OSC agree that those things can be addressed in a reasonable amount of time and, and that's been floated to be 60 days. Um, so we'll see where that ends up, but there's, that's kind of the concept they're looking at. And then come back and they'll do a reassessment on that delta, on that change, but it must be something that can be changed, altered and brought into compliance, still lining up with maturity. You know, there's just so many uh, qualifications for that to happen that it's almost a one and done really. Although they have this provision for uh, a delta uh, assessment, it, it really is a one and done thing. You've got to be prepared and be ready um, for that assessment. And I can tell you everything that they've been designing this for is an expectation that you're going to have a pre-assessment uh, done by someone who's competent in the process. Um, so in my opinion, that's where really the expense of this is being pushed and partially by design by the DOD. You know, they want to be able to say that, you know, the assessment only costs, you know, X dollars. It's not that big of an impact on, on the DIB. However, the real cost is not in the assessment. In my opinion, the real cost is in getting prepared, getting readiness, um, getting a, a pre-assessment done and, and getting that process in place. So um, as you, the more you can spread that out, the more you can start now, the less work there is to do when that comes because they're expecting an assessment to come in. An assessor will come in and either yes or no, yes or no, yes or no, and, and that's it. And if the answer is no on just one item, there's no certification provided. So, uh, so it is a pass or fail um, and it is a maturity model. You know, starting now is, is the way to prevent that from becoming an issue. Um, as Jason mentioned in the beginning, you can technically apparently bid on a contract that requires a, a level of assessment higher than you have, but you can't be awarded. Um, your bid will be considered non-conforming if you, you know, place a bid and you don't have the, um, the, the level of certification for award. And these, this process is not going to happen overnight. You know, assessments themselves could, you know, could take a lot of time getting an assessor lined up, getting that process in place. You know, that's not a, an overnight process. So you don't want to be a, a, at a point where you have a contract you want to bid for and starting the assessment at that point. Right. And, and I think, you know, a couple of things to, to reiterate and bring home and make sure we all heard it. At one point, there was a lot of chatter that maybe the DOD would help with the expense that it would take to get here. I mean, there was, it was part of the FAQ at one point that maybe they would. And it's starting to look like, and I think I wasn't, I didn't see the section you saw the other night, Stephen, but it's starting to sound like the, the philosophy is, well, you probably should have already been complying with NIST 171. And we believe that if you did that, it's not a heavy lift to get to CMMC. So there shouldn't be a lot of expense. But when, when I'm hearing, I don't know if horror stories is the right word. When I'm hearing stories of people having expended a lot of money, it's this front end. You know, you, you, 
depending on your size, depending on your complexity, depending on what your systems are like, I'm hearing people are spending a lot of money to help people or to have people come in and help them get their systems up to date to set these things up. And you, that won't show through in the assessment. The assessment may be a four or $5,000 project. It might be a three day event. Somebody comes in and checks the boxes and does the things they need to do and says, yes, I, you've given me your, you know, your detail, but it's the getting, it's the getting ready part. And that's what I think I'm trying to, to push us to here in our discussion of this NIST 171 is, this is a great example to flow through the exercise. Maybe we've looked at it before, but we haven't sat down and been methodical and said on each one of these sections, what evidence can I hand somebody? If they came in the door, can I really hand them evidence to prove this is what I'm doing? And if I'm not doing it, what can I set up now? Because I know this is probably an activity that's gonna be needed in a year or two when somebody comes in. And another key thing that Stephen mentioned, which is true, is we've gotta demonstrate not only that we do these things, but we've gotta demonstrate from a CMMC perspective that these things have been in place and they're part of your organization. We don't want to find ourselves, I don't want you to find yourself rushing three months before you have to get a certification to do all the things that are on there, because that's when you're going to end up expending a lot of time and money, and you may still end up with an assessor who says, well, you did it two months ago, you haven't been doing it for six months. And while they're still kind of sorting out those standards of what what is it that proves that this is an ongoing part of the program, you know, this is a, just a great time to stop and look at each one of these 110 controls figure out where they line up and don't line up. And there's some good mapping out there that'll show you exactly how they line up, which one it is. If you go to the, if you go to the DOD's, you know, acquisition website where the framework lists or CMMC, you can look in each one of the controls and it'll tell you how it ties to, or what it's standard it ties to. It'll tell you if it, if it ties to this NIST 171. And then you can look at both side by side and realize in most cases, they are literally verbatim the same thing. So if you've got yourself to a place where you're comfortable that you're complying and can prove it, then that's going to help you a lot when somebody comes in. So I guess what I'm saying is uh, now all of a sudden a lot of us are going from our self-assessment to we're going to self-score and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But now is the time for you to stop and give yourself a lot of time to work through this 171 process, these 110 controls, and make sure that you're comfortable uh, with, you know, how well you truly are complying with them. Yeah, there was a statement that said that, you know, the cost of certification and readiness would be borne by the contractor. That was what the DOD uh, released the other day. Um, early on, there was some talk about it being an allowable cost under a contract. Um, you know, there's some questions about how that would apply. Remember, you can't get awarded a contract unless you have the certification. So how does this become an allowable cost of a contract when it's a, you know, a cost that happened before? You know, there's there's questions there. And certainly under, if you look at, at level one, there's not a lot of evidence you need. You know, you don't have to have uh, written policies even under level one. There's, it's a very low threshold, a very low bar at level one for some items. But the truth of the matter, and, and, and what the DOD was has stated is, you know, they said, look, 99% of all organizations will be level three or below, and 90% of those will be level one. That was their prediction. Um, that's not what we're seeing in the marketplace. That's not what we're seeing people drive for, and that's not what I expect to happen, simply because uh, most, you know, most businesses are making the calculation, why go through the process for level one? And then, you know, come up to a contract that I can't bid on for level three. If they're going to go to the process, they're probably going to go to level three. Now, four and five is a whole nother ballpark. And in fact, there's not even been an assessment guide out for four and five yet. It's really not even been fully developed. But but uh, most people, I, I believe, we're going to be going for a level three assessment if they're going to do the process. Because, you know, why spin up all that engine and, and not get to where you need to be so you make sure you can apply for, for all the contracts? Um, so so absolutely getting that evidence in place now is 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 the answer to to uh, to being successful when you're when you're ready for those assessments. And I do think some of the conversations we're having with with others is is that they're kind of approaching it that way. They're saying maybe it'd be a competitive advantage if I'm going to prepare. Why prepare for level one? I want to be able to bid. So a lot are starting to say maybe prepare for level three. You add that to the fact that I think we're going to find there's a lot more CUI than we thought when everything is all said and done. When, and it's going to be easy in many ways to designate. There's a lot of things that could be on the fence, but it would be fairly easy to designate. Now, it's a designation the government must do themselves, something as CUI. So yeah, if you're, I see it growing. You know, if you're a sub and not even a prime, and think about that from your marketing perspective, it's just going to put you in an advantage when you're going to, to prime saying, I'm already level three. 
you know, I, even though the government may say it's not a competitive advantage, you just need the right level for the right thing you're getting awarded. Um, I don't think that's going to be the case in the marketplace. I think that, uh, that you know, prime contractors are going to be looking for subs that have level three so they can say, well, they're level three, I don't have to worry about it. Um, so, you know, I, I just see that that's going to be the drive for, for most organizations to, to try to get to level three and, and, and not one or two. Good. All right, moving on to the next slide here. So let's let's talk about the cyber score, the self-assessment they're performing. Just a, a few maybe of the general questions we're we're hearing and things we're seeing, and uh, you know we'll give you I guess our best thoughts on a few things. Um, one is you know I, we're, I'm just going to kind of start at the top and we'll work our way around the, around the wheel. Stefan and I'll discuss as we go. But as far as who should complete it? Now, we were back earlier looking at that, you know, there's the original 7012 that's out there that, you know, it's been in your contract. If you've had experience, you've been seeing CUI, I mean, you're going to probably need to flow through this process. 7019 was the actual interim rule that introduced the thought that uh, you need to put the score in. 7020 is the one that really kind of puts some fine teeth around. But, you know, ultimately, I think that there's a different question of should you complete it and should you report it perhaps and there's a lot of different opinions out there but going through the should you complete a process let's go back to thinking about doing a self-assessment if you're going to be cmmc one day you're going to have to do one if you are if nist applies you have to do one so why not go ahead go through that self-assessment go up through the scoring process and give yourself a score and try to figure out where you stand so i mean the, the argument would would to me would not be so much who completes it but whether or not you report it and we'll discuss that piece in a second but yeah and i have you say there's a lot of opinions about that i have like 14 of them myself i'm not sure which one's the right one right that the as far as submitting the score i mean one one school of thought is you know if you don't have a requirement you know you don't you don't you don't issue the score at this point. Um, but you know, with the bat we've seen that the federal government likes to threaten and has swung a few times is the False Claim Act. And, and my concern on this is that under 171, uh, you know, many of you are attesting to complying with these 110 controls. I mean, you're, that's that's what's done. You've you've self-attested within your contract that you are complying with those controls, and uh, it's been my experience that people aren't. I mean, that's just not that's just not the case. In fact, that's why the DoD ultimately came up with CMMC is because they realized uh, I'm sure no one was surprised, but they realized that hey, you know, all these people are just checking the box saying they're compliant, but they're they're, they're not compliant. And there's no no evidence that they are. So most people are not. And that's that's not unusual. But my concern is if if you as an organization um, are performing a contract and you have a breach, and then the the DoD wants to decide, you know, to 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 um, investigate that and, and then come up with some some uh, understanding that the reason why this breach happened or something that allowed this breach to happen was a failure on your part to comply with something that was within 171 that you've acknowledged saying that you do comply with. I think you're in a in a sticky situation. Uh, on the other hand, if you did a self assessment score, remember that it allows for poems. You know, it allows for um, for you to not be in the position that you that you technically should be under 171. Um, if you've submitted a score that says, you know, I'm deficient in these areas, but I have a plan and I've got milestones, I've got plans to, you know, to, to complete that, but I'm deficient in these areas. If you've registered that with their system, and then it comes to a point where you had some kind of breach and you had that deficiency, at least you're at the point to say, well, look, uh, I've registered the system. I told you I had that deficiency and you accepted it. So I think you're in a much better defensive position should you have some kind of breach by reporting the score. So I think that's a great argument for reporting the score, even if you may not necessarily need to because of handling currently of FCRCY, but just simply that you're doing contracts, you report the score, you say, look, I'm deficient in these areas. The, the, the catch to that though is, if you're deficient in those areas, you're following your poems, you're, you're, you're doing your SSRs, you need to continue with that process. So if you're if you're going into this theory where I say report as a protection method for yourself, um, then you need to also take the time to uh, to commit to completing the process, completing your poems, getting to a place where you are um, in, in, a, in a better posture as far as uh, complying with 171, at least if not CMC, CMMC. Um, again, you know, I'm not an attorney. I'm not here trying to claim to give anyone legal advice. It's just a bit of, of, con of conceptual thought through uh, whether you should or should not, uh, you know, report that score. And, uh, you know, I guess I looks like I probably ought to speed up a little bit here. But uh, next, as far as when to, you know, when to complete. So the, the interim rule said November 30th, 2020, if you were, if it already applied. And then in future contracts, obviously, before you, you go through the process of future contract, depending on, again, where it applies within the contract. Um, as far as whether or not the numerical score matters, there's probably a, a good point to stop and discuss here a little bit in that, you know, the, the scoring system is a perfect score is 110. You know, so you give yourself one point for each 
you know, each one that you tick off and yes, I've, I've got it. And, but you can actually have as much as a negative, I think 203 score, you know, if, if you take points off. So people are concerned, should I really report a negative score? Will it impact me? Will it not? And there, you know, the official statements that we're hearing is no. What, what, what the DOD wants is for you to report the score because that puts you kind of on the clock in theory of you realize you've got a weakness, you're going to work towards fixing it. Uh, possibly the argument would go if I came down and I had a contract and I'm a contracting officer and I'm looking at two people that are exactly the same, would that higher score impact me and make me want to go that way? Um, yeah. There's a little formula out there for that to assign a cost, you know, a, a security cost, basically saying that you're, uh, you're a more expensive option because uh, you're a higher security risk. Um, and there's some calculation out there for it. Whether it's actually being used, we haven't had any official approval of that. Um, you know, I still keep hearing the official word is, you know, either you have or you don't. It's a yes or no. You comply or you don't. Not, um, you know, what your score is. But, you know, there is some talk that that perhaps could be in the future because we're talking, again, a five-year rollout for CNMC. So my expectation on that is it probably doesn't matter right now. They're probably not at that level, but they probably will get there before the end of the CMMC process and pilot. So um, if you do what we said you know, before, if you, if you are early on and early adopter submitting a score that has um, significant efficiencies identified and you have your milestones in place, you'll want to update that as you go through the process. But you know, that's part of being committed to, uh, to uh, coming into compliance through your POAMs. And, and, you know, that leads into the next one there as far as the SSP, the system security plan and the POAM itself. I mean, it, you need to complete the system security plan to even submit your score. That's one of the requirements. And part of that then is if you have any deficiencies, you've got a POAM, which is a plan of action milestone, which basically puts you on the clock and says, here's what my weakness is. And here's when I think I will fix this weakness and how I think I'll fix it. So it's a good time. Again, just like we we're talking about NIST versus CMMC, it's a chance to find a weakness give yourself time to fix it and get it fixed over time. Then on how to submit the SPRS system, uh, you're all probably very familiar with that. There are actually two pretty good documents on the front page of SPRS website that kind of walk you through with screenshots of how you submit it, how you get yourself entered in uh, as you need to. And then uh, what next and comply is really just make sure you work through that POAM process. Make sure that you get yourself to, you know, follow your plan, get there, get everything up to 110 if you can. And then know that this score has to be, at least in the inter in the short term, has to be updated at least once every three years. So it can't just be a one-time report. At some point over the next three years, you'll refresh it and update it again. Next slide, please. All right. So as far as what you should do now, I, I mean, I think that what, you know, what I'd like to communicate or, or and I, I think what we'd like to communicate is that just stay aware. There's so much information flying around and it's good information. Keep yourself aware of what's going on with CMMC and how it's changing. Keep yourself aware of maybe how the scores are being applied to others. There'll be news that trickles out. There'll be information. There's all sorts of different Fed scoop sites where you can kind of get information about that. Um, and then take the time to evaluate where you are and think about not just NIST, think about BCI, think about ISOs, think about anything else that may apply to you when your contracts. You may have several cybersecurity frameworks that, that you actually have to comply with depending on what your business is and where you're doing business. And then just, you know, again, back to that, you know, POAM thought, if you find a weakness, take the time act to meet it now, because it'll be a lot cheaper to spend, you know, over the next year trying to get yourself where you need to be than it will be if you've got to all of a sudden do it when everybody else is running to do it at the end. Yeah, that, that learning portion is going to be the, the key. This stuff is changing, as we've mentioned, throughout this process. You know, there's probably something new that came out while we were talking, for all I know. But it, it really is changing incredibly fast for, for a function like this. Um, you know, we intend to continue having these type of, of, uh, of webinars to hopefully uh, help you guys stay informed. Um, we'll also be looking to do some roundtables. So if any of you are interested in participating in that, um, please, you know, contact us. You'll see some contact information at the, at the end of this. But, but uh, reach out to us. We'll be happy to get you involved in that group. Those roundtables primarily will be for the purpose of, of exchanging information within other interested parties. Um, so, uh, you know, please uh, reach out to us if you're interested in that. Looks like oh, oh. here we are. <laughs> Watch you there for a second. So again, as I was mentioning, the, you know, that last stage, Act Meet Standards. You know that should you should be the the uh, the the theme of this whole process. You know, establish where you are, even if you're not going to report your score. You know, calculate your score yourself, 
have it, an understanding of where you're at, create your POAMs, start making a plan to get yourself in a, in a certified position, uh, even if you're not uh, gonna, gonna submit the score at this point, because by the time you decide you need to, it's just too late. Uh, you, you need to get on that early on. And, and it will be, you know, even if the CMMC standard doesn't become pushed down until 2025, we expect, well, the 800 once one's already here. Um, we don't see a lot of enforcement yet by primes, although we're seeing some from the larger primes. It, it's going to happen. It's, it's getting elevated, and that's going to become more prevalent. So uh, even though CNMC, and that's kind of why we talked about, you know, yeah, this is a CNMC or, uh, presentation, but really right now what's important is what's happening with 171 to most of the people we deal with. Um, the CMMC is not going to be the driver for you right now. It's going to be that 171. So make sure you're acting to meet the, those standards within the 171. And then, you know, really just real quick, there's a few resources here. Just just be aware that there is a website for the accreditation body. It always has good information on it. They put up the they put up videos of the discussions that they have. You know, the the Office of Acquisition Sustainment is where the CMMC and NIST really kind of lives in those frameworks and some information there. You, you can always look there. There the CUI registry, if you want to understand a little bit more about it, is a good place. Look for the National Archives, some good information about what types of things might be CUI if you're trying to figure that out. Uh, and then, yeah, yeah. And then there's, uh, you know, so the NIST is out there and then the SPRS, we mentioned it earlier, they've got some decent resources just on their front page as well. So to kind of keep in mind, you know, always bring yourself back to some sort of governmental organization if you can, what they're putting out there in theory is, is good usable stuff. Yeah, that's a great comment because there's so many resources out right now, um, people who are um, putting themselves out as some kind of authority, and I hope you don't think that's what we're doing. We're not trying to put ourselves out as a specific authority on this. We're just trying to funnel the information that we've gathered and, and provide it to you guys, um, hopefully, uh, you know, as accurate as possible, but but we want to point you back to resources. We're getting it, um, and if you reach out to us, we'll always be happy to to, to uh, help you understand where we come up with the with the concepts we've come up with so you can make your own decisions, but there are, there are uh, organizations out there that are um, holding themselves out of as authorities in certain ways that is in conflict with either the AB or the DOD, and there's some challenges of that. So do make sure uh, that you that you when you're looking at a resource that you follow it back to an authoritative resource. And then in closing, just real quickly, a few things to keep in mind. Just know, you know, this is here. It's here today. It's here to stay. And all of the different requirements help us springboard into CMMC. Uh, and then, you know, evaluate yourself. And even if you think it doesn't um, apply to you, maybe go ahead and go through the process and check yourself. Because one day you may want to find yourself at level three. This is a good start for you. Or you can pull, pull the framework for CMMC and really get going if you want to. Uh, and then, you know, there's going to be such a bigger impact for all of us because federal contract information is, as you saw in that one graphic, so much broader of a pool. There's going to be a lot of people that didn't have to worry about these standards that are now all of a sudden going to have a smaller basic cybersecurity standard that's going to be audited and tested every three years. And keep, keep a look on contract flow down. If you're a prime, you need to flow this down to, in, in both cases, you know, NIST and or uh, CMMC, you need to flow this down to your subs. And if you're a sub, be looking at your primes and maybe flowing it down to you and you need to make sure as you're signing off on those contracts that you understand what you're getting yourself in for because um, there will be some work to be done. Um, and don't forget, as we keep saying, this is a fluid item. We had the interim final rule uh, in September, but the final rule is expected uh, second quarter of this year. Um, everyone says there's not any expected uh, surprises. I guess they wouldn't be surprises if they're expected, right? So, um, I, you know, I, I, I will not make that statement. I expect we will probably have some surprises in that final rule, some changes somewhere. But uh, the final rule is not out. Uh, and even after that happens, who knows what can change. But it is definitely fluid and, and still changing. And uh, if you have any questions, shoot us an email. There's a contact page here. Uh, or we'll look if you put something in here, we'll respond to you later offline. And with that, Jamie, we'll turn it back over to you so you can finish this out before uh, four o'clock. I gave you about 60 seconds. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, Jason, Stefan, uh, wealth of information here. We understand that with these new changing uh, environments, it can create some uncertainty and confusion. Uh, think of these guys, let them help you navigate through this process. As you know, they're both pretty involved um, as this thing takes shape. So reach out to us if you have any questions. If you would like to join that roundtable group Stefan mentioned, reach out to uh, either of them or myself and we'll be sure to get you plugged in there. 
We will uh, keep you informed as we hold some future sessions on this. So keep an eye out for those details and uh, we'll, we'll send you on your way from here. Thanks again for joining us. And thanks to Stefan and Jason for taking the time to share. We hope to see you next time. Thank, Thank you. you.